In this video I'm going to calculate how much radiation from a cell phone, uh, electromagnetic radiation, may make it into the brain and is that safe. Uh, I'm going to go through my interpretation of this calculation and I'm going to in the end come up with the answer that yes it is safe. And to determine it's safe we'll have to compare the final result after treating the entire system as a transmission line problem to the allowed limits uh, from the FCC. And the, to just jot that down, the FCC allows uh, power dissipation of 1.6 watts per kilogram averaged over one gram. Uh, to go from our cell phone, which I'm going to model as something emitting at its peak power at four watts, all the way to the end user, that is the ear, the eye, the eye, the brain, how much of that energy will make it into the brain and be dissipated over one gram and we'll determine if that's less greater than or less than 1.6 watts. Now there are a lot of steps in here. There's going to be the radiation from the cell phone. How do you determine what is the nature of the plane wave rocketing towards the brain? How does that interact with the different layers going through uh, the head until it reaches the brain? There's going to be the scalp that will have some characteristic impedance. There will be the skull after that, which will have another characteristic impedance, and then you'll be in the brain tissue, which has a third characteristic impedance. Uh, so there will be reflection and transmission at each of those boundaries. And then finally, what's the uh, attenuation constant within the brain, and how do we relate it to this back here? To get started, uh, I'm going to just write out what an electromagnetic wave can do, because th this is an electromagnetic wave that's coming out from the cell phone. What can an electromagnetic wave do at a boundary? Well, for an EM wave at a boundary, and what, I'm, what I mean by boundary is something where the characteristic impedance of two sides of that boundary differ. Uh, and we'll get into what that means in a little bit. But at a boundary where there's a discontinuity in the uh, characteristic impedance, there are only two things that can happen. It can either, the wave can either one, uh, reflect, or two, transmit, transmit. Okay, and neither of these has to be 100%. You could have 90% reflection and 10% transmission, or you could have 10% reflection and 90% transmission, or something along those lines. Uh, when, when it gets into a new medium, when the electromagnetic wave gets into a new medium, a third thing can happen. And I'll, I won't write it as a third number three because it's really not what's going on at a boundary, but when it's in a new medium. Um, and that's the, well, I'll write it as three just to distinguish it. And you can be absorbed. The electromagnetic wave can be absorbed with some characteristic impedance. So let's say you had uh, the boundary here. So here's side one, here's side two, uh, denoting there's reflection and transmission. When the electromagnetic wave gets into medium two, it can decay over time, uh, according to an exponential. And that decay is going to be governed by the absorption coefficient, the characteristic length, uh, Debye length, whatever you want to call it. They all sort of refer to the same thing. Let me scroll down a little bit here. I'm going to talk about what governs these terms. So first, let's talk about what governs the reflection and transmission terms. So for reflection and transmission, transmission. Primarily what governs these terms is the characteristic impedance, which is generally uh, written as Z naught. This is in terms of ohms. Uh, when you write out the expression for the characteristic impedance, this is what it looks like. I'll just write it out and then I'll unpack it. In the numerator, under the square root, we have j omega mu, which is the permeability, the magnetic property of the material, over lowercase sigma, which is conductivity, plus j omega epsilon, which is the permittivity of the material. <clears throat> so you it may be a little hard just by looking at this to get some intuition, but let me do a couple of cases to take it to its limits. So what if we had the case of a metal? What would the characteristic impedance Z naught be in the case of a metal? 
for a metal, we could say probably the conductivity is very high. In fact, let's take it to the extreme and say it's infinity. So mu is approximately equal to infinity. It's not, of course, infinity, but it helps determine this. So Z-naught, in that case, is going to be approximately equal to J omega mu over infinity. That's what that expression comes down to because this term overwhelms this term, and that is in the denominator. Well, what is anything that's finite divided by infinity? Well, that's going to be approximately zero. So this is approximately zero. Great. The characteristic impedance of a metal is approximately zero. So let me write out actually this characteristic characteristic impedance. Impedance. That's what I'm talking about. What about the case of a perfect dielectric or free space? Free space. Or we can say a lossless dielectric. Dielectric. In either case, the conductivity is essentially uh, zero, right? There's no loss in free space, more or less. Maybe you have some water in the air or some, some something, but in if you're out in space, more or less the conductivity is going to be zero. In that case, Z naught is approximately equal to J omega mu over J omega epsilon, and what that just simplifies down to is the square root of mu over epsilon, which for free space is equal to mu naught over epsilon naught, which if you ran the numbers would equal 377 ohms. Okay, That number will be used. That's the impedance, characteristic impedance of free space. Now that I've motivated the characteristic impedance a little bit, let's talk about that second part. Uh, well, not the second part, actually, the third thing I'd mentioned above. Uh, first, I said at a boundary, it could either transmit or reflect. The electromagnetic wave could either transmit or reflect, so that's going to be primarily governed by the characteristic impedance. Once it's in a new medium, when it's in medium two, uh, it's going to be governed by the absorption depth, the absorption coefficient. Absorb. Oops. Spelled that wrong. It should be a P. Okay, the absorption characteristics. Often, so this is represented as the attenuation constant. Attenuation constant alpha. Now you'll hear a lot of different terms relating to this absorption phenomena, this exponential absorption phenomena. You'll hear things like Debye length or skin depth or uh, characteristic length, uh, they all in some way mean the same thing, more or less. The gen most general way of representing it that I've found is the attenuation constant alpha, which is in terms of 1 over meter, and you'll see why it's in terms of 1 over meter when we use it, equals omega times mu over epsilon uh, mu epsilon over 2 times this quantity. I'm just going to write it out. Square root 1 plus sigma over omega epsilon, this quantity squared, oh, minus 1. That's it. That's a little bit of a large expression. I'm going to try to unpack it, but this is the most generalized way to represent the attenuation constant. Where does this, atten I'm and I'm going to draw it out for the condition again of metal and of a lossless dielectric or free space. How does this attenuation constant get used? Well it gets plugged into an exponential so you would have let's say you had incoming wave EI, incident electro, E sub I, the incident electromagnetic wave. On the other side of that boundary you have E sub T the transmitted portion, and let's say after some distance x you wanted to know what e sub x is. Well the way this would be represented is e sub x equals e sub t 
times the exponential of uh, x times alpha. In that sense, you can see it's pretty simple. x is in units of meter, the attenuation constant is in units of 1 over meter, and you would use this expression to relate those two quantities. I'm going to stop here and go on to the next video.